If you are the average taxpayer living in the average California small city, chances are pretty good you know very little about local politics, can name a city council member, or even care where City Hall is located. Chances are even greater that you have no interest in dull topics like unfunded liabilities, CalPERS, or public employee compensation packages. Well, in the next few years, whether you like it or not, you will know a lot about these topics as very few issues will have a greater direct impact on your wallet and safety than these. Like a quiet ticking time bomb, in the next few years, cities all over California are going to be facing severe shortages of funds to pay for all the services you've come to expect while continuing to make payments to former city employee pensions. As a result, basic safety services and maintenance of your city will be affected. Four cities have already gone bankrupt, and many more will go bankrupt in the near future if nothing changes soon. Right now, the average family with two incomes scraping by earning $60,000 per year is funding retired city employee pensions, many of whom receive north of $200,000 per year. A dual class system has emerged that on the surface seems unfair and unsustainable. No fault to the retiree, but if you are a public employee, you have even more to worry about. The system is failing. We decided it was time to take a look at the complex issue and present it in such a way that it will explain what politicians and unions have done to create the problem, what you as a taxpayer can expect, and finally, some common sense solutions. One of the most vocal and persistent voices in getting the message out about the pension problem comes from former Costa Mesa mayor and current city council member, Jim Rickheimer. We've got employees in our city who've retired at 50, who retired at like 164,000, one employee in particular, was not a city manager, okay, was not a high level person, just a regular employee, um, retired at 164. When they're 62 years of age, they'll be making 200,000. When they're 80, they'll be making $300,000 a year. That's just ridiculous. How did California get into the pension mess? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen, but it's basically whenever you get a situation where um, a political group wants more money, they go to their politicians to get it, and in California, the pension system, CalPERS, is not as much as a financial organization as it's a political organization. And the organization is run by um, people that get the pension, retirees, and then some um, other state officials. But basically you've got people politically who will decide how much money somebody can make and that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Um, do you want to tell us what happened between you and the police association? Well, I mean, I mean ba basically, you know, the, the association's job is to get the most they can for their members and we have to all understand that. Um, what's, what's happened from the pension standpoint is that we kind of lost um, some adult supervision over time. And so we have a situation where um, people are asking for things that are unattainable. There's no way they can be paid for. Um, but if you have the votes to get it, you just vote for it and therefore it happens. And so I've been one who just said there's a math problem here. Um, we love our police and our fire. We, they're fantastic people. We have the best um, yeah, in the county, if not in the state, for both those positions. That has nothing to do with the financial issue is what can we afford to pay, especially when it comes to pensions, because pensions are pushed out so far, people kind of think, well, that doesn't really matter. It's not a really big deal. What's happened now is it, it's gotten to the point where now it does matter. Jean Hutchins served on the Costa Mesa Pension Oversight Committee from its beginnings. Costa Mesa recently lost a good friend, Jeff Arthur. Um, he was the chairman of the Pension Oversight Committee uh, and a member of the Financial Advisory Committee. Um, he gave a presentation in April that Costa Mesa Brief covered, and he said that the city of Costa Mesa was headed down a path of financial failure um, and that we could go bankrupt if we did not fix our pension problem. Do you agree with that? Uh, based on where we are now, his statement is, is uh, very true. And, and we just saw that by the reduction in the discount rate. As the discount rate is reduced, CalPERS is telling the state that they're not going to earn as much money uh, return on their investments as their discount rate uh, estimates. And 
and when they reduce that estimated uh, return on investments, then somebody else has to pay that, and the somebody else is actually the state, or in this case, it's the city of Costa Mesa. So in other words, if you or I need money, we go to the bank. When CalPERS needs money, they come to you. City employee unions, referred to as associations and CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System, have negotiated with politicians over the years to get a guaranteed rate of return on their investments of 7.5%. If the economy has a bad year, the taxpayer makes up the difference. The discount rate of 7.5% is what the kind of assumed rate of return on the investments is. Attorney John Stevens, a former member of the Costa Mesa Pension Oversight Committee and recently elected to the City Council, explains. CalPERS has deliberated and decided that, that it's too high and um, the appropriate rate of return is 7%. So over the next three years, they're going to phase that in. So in, in uh, fiscal year uh, 18, it's going to go down to 7.375%, and in fiscal year 19, 7.25%, and then it's going to go down to 7%. In, in 2012, there was also an adjustment. In 2012, it was 7.75%, and it got reduced to 7.5%. Uh, so since 2012, the discount rate has gone from 7.75% to what will be in 2020, 7%. So what can California do to help CalPERS get out of the mess so that cities aren't suffering? It's, it's actually pretty simple. They have to change the plan. There's no other way to fix it without changing the plan for existing employees and nobody wants to talk about that. But the reality is you can't have people retire this young with this much money um, going forward. So if you've earned 20 years of a pension at whatever this plan is, I would say fine, you've earned it, it is yours. But going forward, the plan has to change. California can't change that without a constitutional amendment. The legislators aren't about to do a constitutional amendment. So until we have enough bankruptcies in the state, we're actual pensioners. So if you're at a city that goes bankrupt, you may not get a check. When people quit getting checks, then the state will do something about it. But until then, we'll need, we'll need bankruptcies to solve the problem. Ralph Taboda is the vice chairman of the Costa Mesa Pension Oversight Committee. We asked him what happened at CalPERS that caused this problem. He was blunt. They totally blew it. They, I, it's, it's incredible how much they were wrong. Uh, we're saying, again, with the increased benefits came, that came in year 2000, early 2000s, they say, cities, the state, this is not going to impact you financially. Well, they were dead wrong. And now, especially with the recession in 2008-2009, uh, so it's going to be very difficult and almost impossible for the CalPERS to ever get above water again, because uh, the last two years, um, CalPERS made two percent a return and a zero percent return. Well, that's a far cry from seven and a half percent. So, as long as they can't meet their projections of now the seven percent. Their, that unfunded liabilities can continue to increase, both at the state level and as for Costa Mesa also. So what suggest, suggestions did the Pension Oversight Committee give to the city to manage the problem? We think one of our, our best recommendations was back in uh, August of 2014, we, in the um, police negotiations were going, labor negotiations with the police association were in, were in in uh, going on and um, we recommended that the city negotiate uh, a 14 percent contribution for for the employees or for the police they had been contributing five percent towards their pensions now they're contributing 14 percent so that's a big help where that money formerly was paid by the city now it's being paid by the employees uh, and coincidentally, we have a similar recommendation to the city for the fire department, which is negotiations going on currently. We recommend that the city negotiate a 14 percent contribution, employee contribution rate for the firemen also. So that, would, that reduces the city's share of those costs. It would appear the city council went against the advice of the Pension Oversight Committee and instead during the March 7th City Council meeting, the council majority voted to give raises, increase benefits, and reduce retirement contributions. 
Since we last spoke, the City Council voted to give employees a 13% pay raise over the next three years, a 2% reduction in their um, pension contributions, and an increase in their health benefits by $481 per month. Now, it's been said that this was because the city has to remain competitive with other cities to retain good employees. Is that really a valid concern? Well, two things. Number one, it wasn't a majority vote. It was a 3-2 vote on the council. I didn't vote for it. Um, number two, there's clearly some positions in the city um, that you need to pay more to make sure you get that. The problem that we have in city government is we take everybody's pay grade on every single position with every single year they work and we move the whole thing up 4% or 13% or 12%. Nobody actually looks at it and says, gosh, we need some traffic engineers. We'll pay more from that. They'll go ahead and pay more for everybody. And it's just how the union structured the contract and it just shouldn't be done that way. So is this, because um, some people are saying that this is just uh, paying the unions back for their contributions during the elections. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily just paying back the unions. Clearly, the majority on the council believes that, you know, workers should make more money and, and they want to pay as much as they can and they want to make sure every single position here is filled at the city, whether we need it or not. That's just kind of their come from. It's not good or bad. It's just how they are. The previous uh, council majority was looking more at how do we save money? How do we get things done in the city with, uh, with not as many bodies? Remember, when you hire an employee in our city, it's a 50 to 60 year obligation because it's once they start working, and then they retire, you owe them for the next 25, 30 years retirement. So every single hire is a big deal, 50, 60 year commitment. And I think if people thought of it that way, they wouldn't be hiring as many people. They sure wouldn't be raising uh, wages when you have more than enough people coming on in certain positions. Yes, there are some positions that needed to be raised. They should have just raised those positions and not all the positions across the board. At, on the March 17th um, council meeting, the finance director presented the city's five-year plan, and he projected that the $8.1 million surplus, the previous council, which you were a part of, um, would turn into an $8.5 million deficit over five years. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, a couple things is we have to move in to new technologies and things that uh, bring the workforce numbers down like business has done. We have not done that to the level that we need to do. We've done it somewhat. But you can't continue to give people pay raises. You can't be in a pension plan system that retires you at 75 to 90 percent of your pay and expect it to pay for itself. So a major part of the deficit is what's happening with uh, police and fire. Um, where you as an employee pay say half your social security 6.6 percent and your employer pays the other half in government, we're paying 60% right now for some of our employees. And CalPERS, who handles our pension, has said, we're going to 98%. That means for every dollar I give you, i got to put 98 cents in the bank uh, for your pension. That's just so beyond unsustainable, but nobody seems to look at that. The reality of it is, is that the, the pension plans, the outgo, the money that flows out, has to be renegotiated, and nobody's done anything about that. A lot of people are saying the unions, uh, whether it's the Police Officers Association or the um, Firefighting Union, um, they, they're saying that they're just greedy and they're just going to make things worse. Uh, do you feel that's the case? There was a period of time when there was a concept called pension spiking that was going on in the system. Costa Mesa had safeguards early uh, about pension spiking. And that's where you add to your pensionable income like overtime and certain benefits and things to make the pensionable income higher at the end of your career and therefore your retirement benefits higher. PEPRA, the Public Employee Reform Act, I don't know, whatever, you, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. They closed that loophole. So that can't happen. So anyway, that's a long way of saying we're in a pickle. I do not attribute it, though, to the greed of the public employees. Almost everyone we spoke to made it clear they don't fault the public employee for our massive debt problems, and most stated how much they respect our employees. Mike Glenn, longtime activist and former Newport Beach City Council candidate, was no exception. His city has about one half of a billion dollars in unfunded liabilities, double that of Costa Mesa's. He has a different view on unions. Everybody loves police, everybody loves to fire. There's nothing, not saying anything wrong with that. However, the problem that we have is the unions there. Um, 
the unions influence elections. For instance, in my election, they spent $45,000 supporting my opponent. Well, what do you think somebody's going to do when they get in office, when somebody's elected them, you know, when, they, when they've dumped you know, half or more than half of their total campaign contributions into them? Are they really going to go in there as the, as the, even though it's the biggest problem that we have as a city, bar none? Do you think that's going to be their first on the agenda? They, they know who got them elected, and, and it's, a, it's, the, it's the third rail of politics. Um, when, when organizations like that work to get people elected, they don't see what they see and what we've seen almost across the board. Instead of addressing the problem, we've seen pay raises. And it's just contributing to the unsustainability of the system that we have in place. Now, CalPERS, uh, our pension system through CalPERS was overfunded until 2008. Right. So what, why the sudden drain? Uh, the stock market. Uh, they decided that it would be a good idea to take the stock payers' money and put it all on black. And uh, they lost. Um, and instead of saying, you know, whoops, perhaps we should revise what we're doing. And, you know, in that period of time, you couldn't lose in the stock market. So for an individual, maybe it was the right thing to do. But as somebody that's supposed to be guarding taxpayer money and not gambling with it, the cities and the counties and the states all made terrible decisions when it came down to that. That's exactly what bankrupted Orange County uh, back in the Citron days. And we're seeing the same kind of problems that we had in Orange County being reflected across the state of California because they continue to try to gamble in the stock market. And let's be honest, if they were good at gambling in the stock market, they would not be working in the government. Now, so it's, it was overfunded until the economy crash of 2008. So that's where they lost all the money. So how is it the union's fault that we're in this mess? I don't think it's the union's fault that we're in the mess. I think it's the fault of the government. The government shouldn't be managing the union's money. This, this is money that we're agreeing to pay to people. We should just give them the money to manage themselves. Why are we on the hook for the bad decisions? That makes no sense. Um, the unions, I think, are, are not at fault at all for the poor fiscal management of government facilities. But it also goes back to the 2008, when people in government see that we have an excess of money, their immediate reaction is, spend it now under my term so I can get all the benefits of, of saying that we spent the money. So that's exactly what happened in Newport and Costa Mesa. They saw this excess of money and they said, well, this will never be a problem. Look, we've got even more money than we thought we would. Just spend more. Um, so it's a problem with the CalPERS system itself. This should be a private system. There's no reason why the state should be running a retirement fund. If these people want to manage their own retirement fund, they should be able to manage their own retirement fund. It's their money. Let them manage it. I don't know why the state is holding on to it for them. So the problem's not the unions. It's not any, it's, it's government itself trying to hold on and squeeze every last dime out of these people. We recently caught up with California State Senator John Morlock. He is trying to pass Senate Bill SB 681 that will allow cities to leave CalPERS without penalties. We asked him, who is CalPERS? CalPERS is just a management firm. It's not the owner of cities and their pension systems. Things have got to change. Cities need tools. The cities in the state of California are screaming for help because, let's take Huntington Beach. They've just been told they're going to pay another $4 million in contributions to CalPERS. This means that they're going to have to stop fixing roads, taking care of potholes, working on their parks to pay more into CalPERS. It is now crowding out everything and cities are screaming for relief. We asked Jim Fissler, the current president of the Costa Mesa Finance and Pension Advisory Committee, what he thought of Senator Morlock's bill to exit CalPERS without penalty. Very expensive. You pretty much pay everything plus future stuff, and then you need to set up another system with the same kind of benefits. So it's basically double the cost. So it's like Hotel California. Once you check in, you can't check out. Um, if Senator Marlock has a uh, bill that can address how to get out of that, I would be interested in looking at it. The main thing is we have to practice fiscal accountability and have to have some strong discipline. We decided it was time to call CalPERS headquarters in Sacramento requesting an interview with one of their representatives. Unfortunately, they declined. So who are they? 
The California Public Employee Retirement System is the agency that manages pensions and health benefits for nearly 2 million members. With over $300 billion in assets, last year they were only able to earn a 0.6% return on their investment. When you compare that to the S&P 500's 2016 return of 12.25%, you might think something is wrong. Surely they could afford the best investment advisors money can buy. But as long as the taxpayer ensures their annual 7.5% target is reached, either in the market or by additional burden on the taxpayers, we can understand why they did not want to talk to us under current conditions. On December 21, 2016, the CalPERS board voted to have the cities pay even more to keep the system solvent. Last year, the late Jeff Arthur, who led the Pension Oversight Committee, explained why he thought cities are headed down the path of financial failure. Okay, so the, this is for Costa Mesa. Um, this is on their website. The green line is the revenue. It's proportional on the left-hand side. The red line is the pensions. Pensions are far outstripping the rate of growth. Now here's what the top 150 Costa Mesa City employees are earning and what they're retiring with. What are your f thoughts or feelings on that? Um, congratulations <laughs> to them. Much respect to them for the jobs they do. But looking at some of these numbers and the extended lifespan of people, knowing that some of these can be payments of four to five million dollars after retiring is the problem with the system. Um, but again, they earned it. Much respect. Congratulations. Historically, pensions were a great incentive for workers to take a government job instead of making more money in the private sector. Now the opposite is true. Many are doing much better working for the government. In a period of five years, the average police officer's salary in Costa Mesa increased by a staggering 85 percent. So just to show in 99 that the average salary was 67,000, and now the average salary in, in 2014 is 124,000. At a recent city council meeting, Costa Mesa resident Kevin had something to say about this. Hi, my name is Kevin Norton. I'm a citizen here. Um, I got a few things here that I'm, I got to get off my chest here. And I read this up here about transparency, and what a joke. You guys are, tr you guys are negotiating behind closed doors with public unions with our money. This is a joke what you guys are doing with this. You guys just gave city employees a raise. In what world does a dog catcher make $120,000 a year but here in Costa Mesa? I thought you guys were supposed to be stewards of our money, the taxpayer. Not what everybody else wants in your, in your employees here. $120,000 a year for a dog catcher? Are you kidding me? Actually, Kevin, two years ago, the animal control officer's total compensation package was over $129,000. We came to the Orange County Fairgrounds to ask people their opinion on the unfunded pension liability crisis in California and, more importantly, Costa Mesa. Do you think the taxpayers should supplement the unfunded liability? this oh, us taxpayers yeah but if there's already a billion in debt what was the amount it's a quarter of a billion in Costa Mesa alone in debt on us and that doesn't cover the state what what are they gonna do we got it there probably should be a petition started or something to go ahead to go against what they're doing here because it's pretty obscene from what I'm seeing a petition against it. Yeah, to stop the inflated inflated pensions and whatnot. Oh my God! But I'm Calpers. Oh, I'm a retiree of this of Anaheim Union High School District. You don't get that kind of money. No, I don't get that kind of money. I get peanuts. But I like my peanuts. I'm not greedy. I, I, I they're greedy. This, I, I'm done. That's disgusting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really? I'm not hearing 
a lot of solutions from some of the most vocal anti-pension advocates as far as what do you do besides simply ending it all. That's really not an option. How do we better manage it going forward? And I'd like to hear some of those uh, choices from people. For instance, in the city of Orange, the chair of the Repu Orange County Republican Party, Fred Whitaker, is on the city council. And one of the things that he, he enacted was the city of Orange puts aside money when they have extra money at, into a rainy day fund so that they can make pension payments when there's a spike in pension payments from CalPERS, or if for some reason the city is unable to uh, do some of their usual pension payments due to problems that have occurred. And in 2014, that fund was $4 million. More cities should follow that lead. Newport Beach, which is really conservative, is paying down their pension fund ahead of time. The Orange County Employees Association is the largest independent public employee labor union in Orange County, California. With over 18,000 members, we caught up with its general manager, Jennifer Boyteen, who also serves as the vice president of the California Labor Federation, which represents 2.1 million workers. Now, here's what the top employees are earning uh, in Costa Mesa. Mm -hmm. And this is what a lot of uh, the voters and the politicians are getting upset over, is that they're retiring with uh, around 200K in benefits. Mm -hmm. How do you address that concern of people? So I guess the first thing I'll say is that, you know, if you take a look at this list, mm -hmm. the, the people who are listed on this list are not your rank and file everyday workers. Mm -hmm. They're not the people like um, like you or me who go to work every day um, and, you know, go home, just try to make try to make a living for their families. They're not the people who we represent, who are the maintenance workers and the um, mechanics and the people who uh, take care of the parks and, um, and all of that. Um, you've got the police chief, the chief executive officer, the battalion chief, the fire, you know, the, the captains. This is the executive class. And this is the same thing that we see happening throughout our country, right? Mm -hmm. When you've got um, people who are the heads of big corporations who are making exponentially more money than their average worker. Yeah. And so, so, um, so I think that there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, trying to take some of these numbers um, as sort of sticker shock um, to say, hey, why are these public workers making so much? But then to sort of assign that, uh, assign, assign that income to regular people, to rank and file workers who average, you know, between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year on their pensions, um, and you know, those are people who have worked for a municipality for more than you know thirty years, some of them, and who don't get social security, so that the city wasn't paying into social security on their behalf, and they don't have that added layer of of safety net. Um, so you know, I think that the people who who pull these um, who pull these figures out. Um, I would I would respond to them. Well, what are you then planning to do about um, about you know the police chief? Are, are are you saying that you want the police chief to make less to make less in retirement? Are you saying that you want the CEO to make less in retirement than, than you've than you've currently uh, than you've currently given to him? Well, then how are we going to address that? What are some solutions to that challenge? But that's not really what you hear them talking about. Instead they take these sticker shock numbers on people that are not the rank and file workers and use that as an argument to take retirement security away from just regular hardworking Americans. And that's where I think it's an incredibly politically dishonest um, discussion that's happening. And, um, and, and one that I don't think ultimately is in the best interest of our communities or our country. We decided to pay a visit to the California Policy Center, a nonprofit think tank located in Tustin, California. Its CEO, Mark Booker, a businessman and lawyer, has been warning cities for years about the future of public pensions. What is it you guys do here? We do uh, fiscal analysis of cities and the state, state of California and the impact of fiscal policies on the citizens. Now, I've asked so many people uh, what is a way cities can solve the unfunded liability issue, and I've gotten so many different answers. Do you have any theories or well, ideas? We've dug ourselves into a really, really deep hole. Um, the, there, there, is, there is no possibility that we're going to be able to pay the amount of pensions that have been promised. It, it's, it's just a mathematical fact. And um, increasingly, entities are starting to realize that. They're going bankrupt. There are cities now that have gone bankrupt. There are uh, uh, 
and, and the entire state, if you actually look at it, is hundreds of hundreds of billions of dollars in the hole. As far, and we did a study just recently that showed it at one point three trillion dollars in the hole in the state of California, and getting worse because the problem is they're assuming they're going to make more money on the funds they have invested than what's reasonable. So the um, uh, the, the the hole is really deep. The only way to get out of a deep hole is to stop digging. <laughs> And, and that's what's got to happen. There's got to be the realization, essentially, ultimately, of the electorate to understand that, uh, that we, we can't continue to promise that you can retire at making 250000 a year at age 50 and get a check for the rest of your life for that amount of money. And, and that's what we're promising. And frankly, it, it, it's wrong to be doing that to public employees who think they've got a promised pension that's not going to be there. And it's even worse for the taxpayers who are ultimately on the hook to try and pay things that, are, that, are, that can't be paid. If a private entity was doing this, they would be, the, the, the officers would be in jail. And, uh, but we're doing it through elected officials who are making promises that can't be kept. But are things as dire as politicians make them out to be? The OCEA leader does not think so. For example, the CalPERS system over the last 20 years has realized investment returns of more than 10 percent. If you shrink that down to the last 10 years, which accounts for the economic crash, um, you know, it's between 6 and 7 percent. But then in, in recent years, um, it's been back up to up past the 10 percent mark. And so it fluctuates. It goes up and down and up and down. And just like, you know, when people tell you about investing, uh, individuals investing in the stock market, you don't, um, you don't measure your 401k uh, based on what happens that day, right? You want to sit on it, hold your breath, um, you know, make sure that you're prudently managing the money, make sure that it's spread out in a way that, um, that makes a lot of sense, that, that you're hedging, uh, you know, that you don't have all your eggs in one basket, for example. Um, like but, they did with 2008 and property. Right, exactly, exactly. So you want to make sure you have all your, you know, that, that you're diversified, but then you wait and, and you play the long game. And if you have a bad year, um, the chances are that you're going to recover in the years to come. And that's what we're seeing is happening with the pension system now. How is the uh, the pensions right now, the amount people are making, how is that affecting everyday life right now? Why should we care? Well, in many ways that people probably don't think about. First of all, when we're paying, uh, in some districts it's now 50% or higher of our budget is going toward pensions. That's money directly out of current public safety, for example. If, if we have 50% of the money that's being spent on, on police going toward retirement for police that are no longer working, that means you have 50% less police on the streets. That means you're going to have more crime. You're going to have longer wait times. Same thing with the firefighters. We want our firefighters to show up to, to, to have the facilities and the resources and the number of firefighters so they can be a, a, at a disaster quickly. But if you're paying one firefighter to be not working for every firefighter you have working, you've got half as many firefighters. It doesn't take, it doesn't, doesn't take much math to figure that out. And that's what's happening. We're having, we're having police and firefighters retiring at age 50 and getting a full salary for as long as they worked, right? If they start at, at age 20 and work for 30 years, because, of, because people are living longer, they can retire on a, on a full pension and they get almost 100% pension. So if they're making a quarter million dollars, which most firefighters by the time they retire are, they're going to get a quarter million dollars a year for the next 30 years. That money could have been used to put two firefighters or to put more police officers. And so there's a direct impact on the quality of life. Now, what about, um, we during this last election in Costa Mesa, there was... Uh, on Facebook, a lot of arguing that um, some people made it seem like the firefighters or the police were just greedy, and others are complaining that there's um, not enough firefighters, not enough police. The crime in Costa Mesa, you know, had gone up. How can we address that without making it seem like the firefighters are greedy or, you know, understanding that the crime is caused by not having enough money? Well, I don't blame any individual firefighter or police officer. They're simply, they're simply taking the job that's being offered to them. Um, it's the politicians who are making promises that we can't afford. 
and have that have set up the situation. Um, and, uh, and I do blame the firefighter union and the police union who, first of all, will go after anybody who doesn't support m more pay or more benefits or whatever it is they're looking for and take them off the council. We've seen that happen in Costa Mesa um, with, with, well, we saw it with Jim Regheimer and Steve Messinger, how they put tracking devices on their cars to try and, to try and put them in a compromising situation so that they could get them off the council. And uh, so the, the unions will ask for money, more money every year. And if the politicians are being elected by them, they have no will whatsoever to, to say no. And so the, the, this is never a knock on any individual firefighter. But um, as you said, crime is going up in Costa Mesa. Uh, wouldn't it be far better to have twice as many police officers than to be paying police officers full salaries that aren't working in their retirement? And the same thing with firefighters. Have you heard of Senator Morlock's Bill 681? Well, something like that, I think I would, I would support, and it, it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. It's definitely not a solution for the fact that we've made promises to current, uh, current public employees that we can't keep. And it's public employees that need to hear that. They're the ones that are being lied to by the politicians, by their, uh, by their unions. It says, look at these great you know, benefits we've gotten for you, and they're not going to be there. Now, we actually contacted CalPERS uh, to try to get an interview with them, um, with anyone, and they refused. Uh, why would they refuse? They don't want to talk about it because they know they've got a big problem.